The Hidden Meaning of Truth and Untruth Part 4 Next, Arti, then Shailesh Shet. In the editorial, Niruma has written, when one begins to devote himself to the attainment of bliss of the self, thereafter, insistence on the worldly truth becomes a form of impediment. How is that? Can you please explain that with an example? There is worldly truth, is there not? The kids should come by 10 o'clock. And if they're late, then won't the mother feel disturbed? Yes. That's called insistence on worldly truth. Does that increase or decrease our happiness? Decreases. The tea was supposed to be had at 7 o'clock. But what happens to us if they ask us for it at 9.30? <laughs> we get angry. <laughs> then, see, you want everything at the precise time. Why did you change the time? I won't accept it. When it comes to the relative truth, there should be no insistence towards that. You should not speak like this. Where are your manners? Is this how you speak? Speak with respect. Is this not holding on to and insisting on worldly truth? Does this become an impediment on the path of moksha, liberation? Of course it becomes an obstacle. You hurt others, you have insistence. This means you're in the ego, and you've lost the state as the self. If there's any work to be done, if there are five of you in a committee, and you say, we should do it this way, but another says, no, we don't want to do it this way, let's do it that way. Then what will happen to us? The other four get together and say, what you said is wrong, we should not do it that way, it should be done this way. Then do you feel anything? Yes. What happens? Oh, you're all such nice and understanding people. <laughs> I really like the decision that you people made. No. What? No. Then what happens? We get angry. That's it. That's called insistence. That's becoming insistent. My way is right and I am right. So if things don't go according to our will, do we cause quarrels? Yes. Why does she cause quarrels? Because she wants to do things her way. And for that, she becomes insistent. And that itself becomes an obstacle for moksha. The progress towards moksha. Moksha is for the one who is without any insistence. Not for the one who is insistent. And it is the relative truth. Some will say, you should worship this way. And others will say, no, you should worship this way. Do it this way. You should say this five times. No, you should say it eleven times. They become insistent in the relative for worldly interaction, don't they? Yes. Then will the attachment and abhorrence increase or decrease? Increase. If attachment and abhorrence increases, then will they attain moksha sooner or later? Later. Look, you've decided it, haven't you? <laughs> it's because you explained it. And secondly... Second question for the second time. <laughs> <laughs> Shailesh Shet. Jai Satchidanan. Next, Pravin Bhai Mehta. Dada has given importance to purity and morality. Then is that a relative truth? And if it is a relative truth, then what are its connections with the Sat? Absolute truth. And then there is another word, transparency. What is the connection of transparency with all these? You know they have signboards. The board will help us reach up to a certain spot, but you shouldn't just sit near the board. Using the board, you can go to Mumbai. There may be a board here. It'll say this is the direction to go to Leicester. When you read the board, you start going towards Leicester. It's helpful. That which is helpful cannot be considered the ultimate. Once you've reached there, then the board's not needed. Similarly, sincerity, morality are all helpful to come towards the self. If a person is insincere or immoral, then even the worldly life or in the community, he won't be accepted. We cannot keep this insincere man at our workplace. He'll deceive us. An immoral person, he won't do in the community. This is not acceptable. Don't they consider this in the community? Yes. Some communities will accept him and say, stealing is our religion. Whereas another community will say, you should not steal at all. Don't these exist? Yes. So all this, what is sincerity? It is to stick by the decision you've made. 
and to follow it. Then you'll be able to reach your goal. It can be in the relative, and beyond that, in the real, I am pure soul. So stay sincere to the five agna. That will take you towards the self. Sincerity is a type of relative attribute. It's a relative truth. Both insincere and sincere, if you stay sincere, then that will help you. And if you stay insincere, you'll get beatings. The self is neither sincere nor insincere. It is beyond that. It's separate. The self is separate from the one who is moral or immoral, but this is helpful. The intellect takes one in worldly life, and the heart takes one from the worldly life to the self. Even though the heart is relative, it can take one towards the self. This is its importance. These are like stepping stones? These are stepping stones, or helping. It's supporting. If you take this path of morality, then you will reach the self. If you take the path of sincerity, then you will reach the self. What is morality? It's to enjoy things that come naturally to you, and that which are rightfully yours. Beyond that, you should not even see other things. If you are having your meal, and they keep fritters and crisps nearby, but they don't offer it to you, you may ask for it. But there are many who don't even ask for it. They'll say, if it comes to me, then I'll eat it. If not, then it's fine. When monks go to someone's home humbly asking for food, and the person only gives them some rice and curry, even though he has some nice desserts ready at home, now won't the monks just take whatever they're given and start walking? Yes. Will they demand, what's that? Give me some. <laughs> They won't demand. We humbly ask for some food. Give us a little to fill our stomach. We don't want anything else. They don't demand. Demanding for things means one's morality is compromised. Whatever one gets naturally and spontaneously is as good as milk. Whatever is asked for is as good as water. And whatever is snatched, that's more dangerous. It's said to be like blood. So what is morality? That which one receives naturally and spontaneously is morality. If you go beyond that, then that's the interference of the ego, which causes suffering and external inducing problems. It binds offenses for you. And transparency? Transparency means to come into the original state. That's transparency. Purity. When anger, pride, deceit, and greed are gone, a person has come into purity. And when the ego and intellect are gone, then he has come into transparency. That state is even higher than the state of purity. Dada says, we have transparency. People expect transparency in management and worldly dealings. Those are all worldly matters. Keep a proper account of money. You have no transparency. That's all relative truth. This transparency, when one reaches the state of absolute knowledge, then that is considered being transparent, completely transparent. It applies to the absolute knowledge. And it applies to absolutism. When absolutism is complete, then he goes to moksha. That is, it's there until 359 degrees. At 360 degrees, it's complete. The one who comes at 360 degrees is called transparent. Then his state is complete. Jai Sachidanan. Jai Sachidanan. Then Praveen Bhai Mehta, Renuka Gadvi. Pujashri, Jai Sachidanan. Yes, Jai Sachidanan. When we read the hidden meaning of truth and untruth, I had a few beliefs that the truth is right. I had some type of strong, staunch beliefs. There was opposition to untruth. After reading the speech, the truth has become untrue and the untruth again becomes the truth. That line has moved away. Dadashri has put the responsibility on us for drawing that line of demarcation. So that becomes a problem at times. Some may try to take advantage of it, misuse it. Now every time, I have to determine whether it is the truth or not. Whereas earlier, it was very firm. Especially in worldly science too. I think that oxygen is the life-giving gas, and it is beneficial. Some say that it is nitrogen. If I consider mine as untruth, and believe his point as the truth, then that causes a problem. So all these standards that need to be maintained, how do I keep the standards? That is my question. Jai Satchidan. The easiest, the easiest path of all this is, to not hurt anyone is the ultimate truth. 
You may be right or nice. He may be wrong or bad. But you have no right to hurt him. When we say, we are right, then wouldn't the other person get hurt? You're wrong and I'm right. If it hurts the other person, then you should stop. Come out of that insistence. You are... If a small boy's doll falls down and he begins to cry, then is that his truth or untruth? Is the doll a truth or untruth? Untruth. Huh? Sorry, I have a hearing problem. <laughs> No, if the doll fell from the bed... That is Vevastit. Yes, it falling down is Vevastit. But would the child understand Vevastit? No. He'll say, my doll fell down, and he'll start crying. <laughs> so should we call that untruth? Hey, this is untruth. Why are you crying over it? <laughs> but it's a truth for him. Instead, you should say, hey, what happened, son? Oh, your doll fell off? Here, give it to me. <laughs> you should hold it and comfort her. Cover her with a proper handkerchief. Put her to sleep nicely in her cradle. Poor thing is hurt. She fell down. <laughs> Let her sleep for a while. We'll wake her up later in the afternoon. If she's feeling better, then we'll go and play with her. Should we not say this to him? Yes, we have to say it. Because his truth is different. Even the doll understood it. Huh? This doll understood the it. The doll has to understand it. <laughs> and if we say... Why did you keep crying over this doll? This is not a true thing. Why don't you understand? Then he'll start crying and screaming even louder. <laughs> Therefore, the truth of the world is a relative truth. Find a solution where it does not hurt him. Do you understand? It has to become simple for us. Let there be no hurt caused to anyone through our mind, speech, or action. We don't want to hurt the foundation of anyone's belief system. You're stealing. That's wrong. You're destroying your life by doing that. A question arises here. If we do not cause any hurt to others, which is beneficial towards Sat, eternal truth, yet when we talk to people out there in public, they find it contradictory. No. Even though we are totally correct? We can say that to steal is bad, but we don't have the right to tell the thief, you're wrong. Instead, we can say, there's so many risks that come with stealing. Do you like this? You should understand the risks. Resolve that what you're doing is wrong. That's it. But to tell him, you're wrong, stop doing all this. Is it in his control to steal? No, not. It's his discharge karma. So the discharge karma, the relative knowledge that he had previously, in his past life he gave opinions like, I will do this. I will enjoy. Now his actions won't change until his opinions break. So there's no reason to blame his actions. You're a bad person. You're wrong. Stop this. Give him the understanding. Should you be doing these wrong acts? Don't do this. Consider all the dangers that come to you due to this. Will you like bearing the responsibility? The police will catch you. People will beat you. Will you like that? Do you understand that what is happening is wrong? So resolve to not do such wrong things. So our right is limited to help him decide this. Mm. We don't have the right to stop him from doing it. Smoking a cigarette, the one who says you should smoke is considered a single offender. And the one who says you should stop smoking cigarettes is considered a double offender. Why? Because you're interfering with the authority of the non-self. To say you should smoke is also wrong, and the one who says stop smoking is twice as wrong. Why are you insistent? Mm -hmm. To smoke is in the control of the non-self. You can tell him this much. The four steps that we discussed, to smoke cigarettes is wrong. You decide that what is happening is wrong. Make sure to repent whenever you smoke. Oh Lord, what's happening is wrong. It'll be nice if this stops, mm. and analyze how it's wrong. It harms the body, it harms the society, it causes financial loss, it'll damage your health, it'll cause diseases. Would it be considered a good moral value if children were to smoke in front of you? Hmm. Understand that it's harmful in all ways. And beyond that, never protect it. What's wrong with it? What's bad about it? What's wrong with smoking? Don't say that. This is wrong. At least have a feeling of remorse in your heart. One day, if you ask him, after 6 to 12 months, he'll say, now I've stopped smoking. 
if you nag him every day, when will you stop smoking? Why don't you stop? Why don't you understand? This is wrong in our house. Then what will that person decide? I'll smoke. What will you do to me? <laughs> the relative truth needs to be understood. It is a relative truth. It is ideal if he does not smoke. There are dangers of smoking. But for that, we don't need to become insistent. And we don't want to quarrel. It'll stop as per its method. Learn that method. Dada is teaching the method. It is our duty to learn that method. Yes, that of the method. Jai Sachidanan. Jai Sachidanan. Renuka Gadvi Pushpa. Go ahead. Pujashri, in the reference to the last paragraph on page 12 of the hidden meaning of truth and untruth, you mentioned three things Astitva, existence, Vastutva, knowledge about what the self is and what it is not. And what was the third thing? Purnatva. Purnatva. Okay. So in that... Astitva. Now I understand that Astitva means I am what I am. I am. Dada says that a person has absolutely no conviction that I am something eternal. I will die. He is completely living in a temporary state. What will happen to me? I'll die. Please save me, doctor. Whereas the other person will say, this body's help has deteriorated, but I am permanent. The body has this disease due to its karmic account. The fruits of my karma will come and it'll get settled. I will die does not mean that I'm going somewhere else. It's just that the body will change. I'll get a new piece of clothing. He has this type of conviction. He's not fearful or sorrowful or depressed or frightened. He's not sad. If he simply has the conviction that I certainly exist, then that alone can make a person so stable. And if he realizes that I am the realization of Vastutva, then he is blessed eternally and will go to moksha in one or two lives. Jai Sachidanan. Pushpa. Then... Pujushri, Alicia, Jai Sachitanand. What is Dada trying to say? Sat is the only thing in this world that is permanent and it cannot be confined with any boundaries. Hmm. It can penetrate right through the Himalayas. No walls obstruct it, nor do any restraints hinder it. Sat means eternal, the self. Don't they say that the self cannot be burnt by fire? Fire cannot burn it. Wind cannot dry it. If you fire a bullet at it, then the bullet will go through it. But nothing can kill the self. No weapon can cut it. It's talking about that sat. It'll go right through and through the Himalayas. Yet the Himalayas cannot obstruct it. What can obstruct it? The ego. Mishya Chetan. The mixture of the self and the non-self. That's the only thing that is hindering it. But if the relative self or pote comes into the self, then no bondages remain. Nothing can restrain it. Bondage is only due to the ignorance of the self. No other object or matter is able to bind it. That's all what he's referring to. Did you understand? Yeah. Next, Alicia. After that, Babu Keshwara. Birmingham. Jay Sachidanan. In this book, Dadashri says, God says this. Which God is he talking about? Because in Akram Vignan, as I understand, there's no superior who is our God. That's correct. You've understood it correctly. <laughs> but in this book... God means he's referring to Lord Mavir, or the God that was present at that time, be it Lord Krishna, Lord Mahavir, or Lord Parshwanath. You can consider that as the self-realized God. In the end, even if it reaches Dada Bhagwan, then there's no problem. Okay. But God means whoever was present at that time. For us, who is the God? Lord Mahavir is considered the God. He, currently his spiritual reign or shashan is going on. So the liberating speech or advice that he gave is the support for us. And that God has said this. In one place, Dada has said, God used to say, avoid clashes. And I can still hear those words. 
I can hear the advice and the liberating speech that God used to give. And that is the same thing I'm telling you. So for us, it is Lord Mahavir. He revealed this spiritual science. So his speech remains as a big support for all the living beings in Bharat Chetra. So he is considered the current God. Do you understand? Yes. Babu Bhai. And then Hemlata Shah. Jai Sachidanand Pujishri. Yes, go ahead. It's written there. It is from Aptamani 14, Part 3. Hmm. It's written in the editorial that the original self is in the form of absolute knowledge and the pure soul is in the form of pure knowledge. Then the question is, does the pure soul fall under Sat or Satya? It falls in Sat. They're both the same. There's not much of a difference. Okay. But it falls under Sat. All right. Okay. It's because the relative viewpoint has arisen and until one turns about, once he is turned about, that's called Nishchei, the self and its realm. The self, the pote, comes back to its original state. Okay. And if we want to explain satya in just one sentence, can you please shower your grace and put it in just one sentence as a solution key? We'll talk on that later. As an extract of the whole book. We'll talk on that later. Wait, you ask too many difficult questions. Hemlata Shah and then Pratibha Shah. Go ahead. Pujishri, it is said on page number 11 in the book that those who have believed worldly interaction to be real and have remained stuck on it have developed high blood pressure and heart attacks and other ailments, whereas those who consider worldly interaction to be false have become strong and stout. That doesn't mean you should tease the strong and the stout. Hey, you consider worldly interaction to be false. We should not say that. <laughs> <laughs> Dada is trying to say this in a general sense. The one who's remaining stuck in world interactions will always be in quarrels. And the other person will always be careless. Those who keep their feet on either side have strayed away. Hmm. We, the Gnani, are free of all attachment with Rag while residing in worldly interaction. I think this last sentence seems to have a very deep meaning. Could you please explain it? Because we, the Gnani, remain the knower-seer of the worldly interactions, we do not hold on to the worldly interactions. Therefore, we are free of all attachment or vitrag of the worldly interactions. What do you have to be vitrag from? You only need to be vitrag in worldly interactions that you encounter. So if one remains separate from the worldly interactions, then it means he has become vitrag. No abhorrence towards the bad, no attachment towards the good. He will call the good things as good, but there is no attachment towards the good things. He will call the bad things as bad. Just as if he's holding a stone and a biscuit of gold, and he's asked to throw away one item, then he'll throw away the stone. Why are you being partial towards the gold? He'll reply, it's a worldly interaction. This is more valuable. The other is not worth anything. But he has no attachment or abhorrence towards it. If someone beats him and takes away the biscuit of gold, then he'll not have abhorrence towards that person. Why? Because he has become vitrag, free from all attachments and abhorrence. So don't believe the worldly interaction to be so true that you lose your moksha. When one considers the worldly interaction as the very truth, then it so happens. Some people believe that their religion is the truth. You should do this and not do that. How can it be like this? How can it be like that? If the Gnani has his clothes on, they'll question, a Gnani should be like a monk, wearing these clothes, pants? Dada wears boots, a dhotyu, a coat, and a cap. Then how can he be a Gnani? So if they become insistent on the worldly interaction, they will miss the path to moksha. If one becomes insistent on the worldly interactions, then his moksha will be hindered. On the other hand, some people do corruption. They say, let's eat, drink and enjoy. Let's betray people, cheat others, and let's get into treacherous activities. Such a person is completely ignoring the worldly interaction. He's not aware that someone is getting hurt. He's enjoying, but taking on a lot of liability. So both will stray away, the ones on either sides.
and we, the Gnani, are free of all attachment while residing in worldly interaction. What is the worldly interaction? It is the result of the karma we have previously bound. Settle each and every result with equanimity and become free. Don't hold on to it. Do you understand? Yes. Jai Satchidanan. Jai Satchidanan.